Buonasera. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Italian Cultural Institute. Uh, I apologize for the delay, but uh, uh, there was some uh, traffic today. <laughs> and, uh, we were waiting for our speakers. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening uh, devoted to Fernanda Pivano, one of the um, beloved uh, women of Italian culture of the post-war period. Um, this event is an anticipation, a prequel to the Festival of uh, Disobedience, uh, which will take place in Santa Margherita Ligure in Italy to celebrate Fernanda Pivano after 10 years from her passing. Uh, to talk about Fernanda Pivano, we have tonight uh, two distinguished speakers. Um, Erika Jong, um, novelist and essayist with over 26 published books that have been influential all over the world. Her new book of poetry is titled The World Began With Yes and it's due for publication on April 16. Has it been published? Is it out yet? Is it the, the book of po Your new book is? This week. This week, <laughs> okay. Um, next to her, we have Jeannie Aladev, um, who was late. <laughs> She's the author of a memoir, The Sun at Midday, Tales of the Mediterranean Family, and a novel, Diary of uh, Jean. Am I pronouncing it right? Yeah. <laughs> she founded and edited two literary quarterlies, Normal and 21st Century, in the late 80s, and has since contributed to many magazines, including... Uh, the Drawbridge and New York Review of Books. Uh, the moderator for the evening is Francesca Pellas, an Italian publishing professional living in New York. She works for Edizioni Black Coffee, an independent publisher based in Florence and specializing in American literature. So, uh, without further ado, I'm leaving the floor to Francesca and our distinguished guest. Thank you. Okay, I hope it's on, yes. So welcome everyone, thank you for being here. I am really honored to moderate this talk with these two amazing minds about another amazing mind, uh, Fernanda Pivano. Uh, Fernanda Pivano was a legendary Italian translator uh, who brought to Italy uh, basically all of the um, most important American writers. Uh, Hemingway, Kerouac, the Spoon River Anthology, many, many, many more. Um, so there is a thing uh, that you both have in common, which is that you both were close friends with her. And uh, so my first question has to do with this, with friendship and with how some people and some friends can change our life, because in fact, there was an important friend, an important mentor in Fernanda's life who changed uh, her, the path of her life and her destiny, um, Cesare Pavese. Cesare Pavese was one of the most important Italian writers and one of the founders uh, of Einaudi, which still is the most prestigious publishing house that we have in Italy. And Cesare Pavese was uh, a high school teacher of Fernanda, um, a high school teacher of Fernanda who, um, elicited in her uh, this love for American literature and in fact one day asked her this question when she uh, was already uh, in college, she was about to graduate and he had just gotten back from confinement because he had been arrested by the fascist regime. And uh, so he asked her, uh, you're about to graduate, you're writing your final dissertation on Shelley, so in English literature. Why not American literature instead? And her question was, but what is the difference? And so that <laughs> night, that night, Cesare Pavese gave her four books. These four books were Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman, Sherwood Anderson's autobiography, Farewell to Arms by Hemingway, and the Spoon River Anthology. She started reading the Spoon River Anthology that night, and she started translating it 
in secret. And that was her first published translation with the help and with the editing of Cesare Pavese. And that gave start to her life, to her path, to her destiny. She was Hemingway's translator. And uh, so my how, question- How old was she? She was she really young. She was young. probably 21. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the thing is that our people, special people, who really change our destiny and make us discover what our destiny is. And she was a friend and a mentor for both of you. So we will get in depth later, but my first question is, how did you two meet her? What was your encounter like, the first encounter between the two of you? I don't, I don't remember what was the first, but I do know I knew that she was the translator of Hemingway and Allen Ginsberg and that she loved American literature. She later told me she had had a nanny who spoke English to her from a very young, young age. And there was something adventurous about Nanda that was almost American. You know, Italians and Americans love each other because we're adventurers, we go overseas, we seek the new, all of that. But she was extremely protective of me. You may remember there was a show done by Maurizio Costanza in Rome, and he didn't like women very much. And he made fun of them, particularly women writers, women intellectuals. So Nanda came on the show to protect me. And then I knew she was really my friend because she made fun of this very short male chauvinist pig. And she, she said my writing was important and adventurous and I knew she was my friend. She expressed it by her behavior. So we got to know each other after that. She reviewed many of my books. And then when she was one year from leaving this earth, she gave me the first Nanda Pivano Award at La Milanesiana in Milano. And I was absolutely blown over by that. So that's how I knew her, but I knew her to sit by her side in Rome, in Milan, and talk and talk about everything. Uh, that's a much more adult uh, <laughs> recollection. So I was, uh, I think I was 13. I was very awkward. I was living in Japan. And um, Fernanda arrived with her husband, who was an architect, Ettore Sotsas, and that's actually why we have to thank Olivetti, um, because he was a designer for Olivetti at the time. So that's why he happened to be in Japan, and she happened to be in Japan. And she talked to me, which I thought was very extraordinary, because at the time, people didn't really talk to me very much. And, um, and I think she thought, to, I was completely dazzled by her beauty. I mean, we have to mention that, because she was very beautiful. It had this very short, uh, very blonde hair and mother of pearl lacquered nails. And she wore very big silver rings, Indian rings, with sort of like, like grapes. And, um, and she had a very forthright way. And she immediately understood that I could speak two, two languages at least, and so that was interesting to her. And I later found out, and Francesca will, will um, confirm this, wasn't it the father brought Berlitz to Italy? So there was a linguistic I think it was right. background. Um, her grandfather was one of the founders of the Berlitz school. There you go. So there was a really, she had it in her genes. So even before Cesare Pavese, there was an impulse to translate. So. The, my, my, but my very first approach, aside from this encounter, which was uh, really impressed me, was when she got back to Milan, 
she must have thought I really looked a bit idiotic. It was the 60s, and, and I you know, was wearing very a little uniform from the Sacred Heart and all this, <laughs> which is really not Nanda, because Nanda was well into the 60s. She was a wonderful 60s character, dressed in hot pink and orange. And um, the minute she got back to Milan, she mailed me a wonderful pair of shoes. And they were um, patent leather, pink shoes, hot pink shoes. <laughs> Um, so, I, I mean, the, you know, when I received this, I was completely won over. And then later I went to boarding school, and it was in boarding school in Italy. Uh, Nanda decided I should translate. You know, at this point I was 15. And, um, and she, she was doing a magazine, I'm sorry if I, I go on too long, but she was doing a magazine, Francesco will mention it, called um, the Fresh Planet, for which one of these awards Pianeta is Fresco. Pianeta Fresco. Yeah. What was it called? Pianeta, Pianeta Fresco, Fresco. Which Fresco. was a very beautiful 60s object. It was printed in psychedelic pink and green, and you had to turn it around a lot. And she was publishing Allen Ginsberg, Kerouac, Ferlinghetti, all these writers. And she sent me some text to translate, so that was... She, she sort of believed I could do it, uh, which was extraordinary. And, um, and I started translating for the magazine, which was really fun, and most of the time I didn't know what I was doing. And there was something like, a, there was a... a <laughs> there was, I remember I hadn't been exposed to American culture at that point, on, only to British culture and in Japan. And so when I found something called the Castro convertible, I didn't know what to make of it. I thought, <laughs> Fidel Castro and the convertible, how does that, you know, what is that, a kind of car that he would have liked? I, could, I didn't know what that meant, so I had problems. But, but your, your story about Nanda reminds me of another reason why I loved her. She understood that women should support each other. Yes. Completely. And throughout my whole early life as a writer, I was damned by women. This is during the so-called second wave of the feminist movement. Um, and blessed by men. John Updike, Henry Miller got my work and loved my work, but women writers hated me. And I don't know, that all has changed now. I mean. Young women writers tell me I kicked open doors, which I'm very proud of. But Nanda understood that part of feminism is women helping each other. And liberation, too. And liberation. So, you know, when I went to see her once in Milan, um, I was still in boarding school, and in the minute I could, I could, I'd get on a train and go see her and her husband. And then when I got there, when I was about, 16 and a half, she said to Ettore, she said, look at Chini, she's looking pretty good. And, he, and, and then she, she looked at me very seriously and she said, um, you must promise me to use contraceptives. <laughs> and I thought that was the most wonderful thing because I wasn't even using sex in any, possible, in any way. So you, she was very much for liberation, you know, the pill and all of that. So. And protective of other women, yeah. which is something I learned from her, that if you're a feminist, you help other women. You don't compete with them, um, no matter how much you've been trained to. And that was very special in her because even today, women are not supportive of each other. And I made a promise that if I ever had the ability to help other women writers, I would do so. Uh, because that's feminism to me. Yes, this is a beautiful thing that you say, that um, uh, she understood that you needed a mentor. And uh, she made herself available yes. for that. And you also say, again, that uh, the activity of a mentor is at the core of a feminism. And said, so that, that was what she was for you and also a mother to your books mm -hmm. because she helped 
uh, get them published in Italy. So I would like to know, there is one thing that Nanda said about um, her favorite American writers of the time, um, of the latest generations before, before she died. And she says, uh, my friends now are Erica, Jay McInerney, Brett Easton Ellis, uh, the three of them at the beginning, like it was all, almost impossible uh, to understand uh, what they were writing. And I am very proud uh, to have helped get them published in Italy. But for the public, for the audience, their work was very difficult, like Henry Miller's, like Charles Bukowski's. And now they all are bestseller writers, uh, but you should have seen how difficult it was to um, help get them accepted and published. So I would like to know a little bit more about that, about the role that she played to get you published in this old country. She, I, I don't know the backstory on that. I only know that when I, whenever I published a book, she wrote about it and guided people to understand it. She was very close with my longtime publisher, Bampiani, and she was the person who first reviewed the book often and made a place for it in the world. I wish we had one of those reviews here. I wish we did too. Yeah. So yeah, that would be wonderful. And I also think that uh, a very important trait about her was uh, the friendship that she was able to develop with the writers that she was yes, translating. Yes, she was, uh, she was very nurturing. And that's odd and very rare for someone is, who's a critic and translator. She genuinely loved writing and writers. And that's really important, and it's something I learned from her, that without that love, you can't do anything well. Also, I have to tell you that at the very end of her days, when she was in a nursing home in Milan, um, she was wearing on her gown a Barack Obama pin. <laughs> and she was being wheeled from one room to, an, to the next. Uh, Obama was running for president. And she would point to his face and say, my latest husband, I adore him. She was extremely funny. I mean, was she when you knew her, Jeannie? She was very funny, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, she was funny. And, um, when I was in, um, in boarding school, she sent me the letters written in turquoise ink. I don't know if she <laughs> was still using them. Um, so th these, you know, they still came in an envelope with a stamp and everything. And, um, and they smelt of Mitsuko, of the, this Guerlain perfume. And at one point, and she would send me these texts, which were a poem or, you know, um, four or five pages or whatever. And one day, instead of these usual four or five pages, I got the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which I think um, Allen Ginsberg had introduced her to, because Allen Ginsberg was by then deep into Tibetan Buddhism. Ah. He'd met mm -hmm. his guru in Colorado, Trungpa Rinpoche. And so this copy of Evans Wendt's Tibetan Book of the Dead arrived. Um, in, in this little boarding school, and I had a really great time reading the part <laughs> about where you have to talk into the dead man's ear, and everybody thought that was really fun. And then, of course, I had to tell Fernanda. She wanted us to translate it together. That was one book she wanted to translate with me, and the second one was uh, the American Book of Slang, the, you know, Book of American Slang. Needless to say, there were two big, these projects, but um, that, that also shows the, the range of her interests. But she, yeah. she was so humorous, and she got the American spirit. I can't imagine anyone else, any other European translator, coming upon Allen Ginsberg and getting him. I mean, really, it was quite amazing. 
And there was something very female about her, which you point out. And yet, she wasn't prejudiced against male writers. She loved them equally, which is very rare. You know, she had this Catholic taste. And she put up with a lot as well. But uh, I think one aspect of her translating, which I find uh, very interesting and something that she did tell me also, uh, was that she thought it was very important to, to introduce the writers, not just translate them, but introduce them to the public, write an introduction to the book that you translated. Absolutely right. You know? and so she was never just in a position of translating. She was really bringing the writer. And many translators are afraid to go further. You or know, not allowed to. They're not allowed to. They're <laughs> right. hired yeah. to translate the book. But the really great ones, um, for example, my translator in Italy of Fear of Flying, she didn't know all these Yiddish words that, are, that I use humorously because I'm very New York Jewish and I use them in a funny way in my novels, maybe in the way that Philip Roth did um, and other Jewish American writers. My first translator, Marissa Caramella, went to the rabbi in Milan. She's not Jewish and she presented all these <laughs> words. That's a great translator. A great translator enters into the spirit. Don't you, don't you wish you'd been at that meeting? <laughs> I was told about it. I was yeah. told about it by Marissa, who's remained a friend. Mm -hmm. And she even made up phrases for zipless fuck and other things and ran them past the rabbi. <laughs> so it was quite a humorous connection. Um, but that's a great translator who loves the work, loves its spirit, and tries to convey it to a new audience. She was very rare, Nanda, and a lovely human being. I'm sure she was very kind to you. Well, I, I think... Uh you know, I have done a few translations and compared to Nanda, really few and really short. Uh, and but if I may intervene, you're the um, translator in English of Patrizia Cavalli, who's according to me, our most important poet mm -hmm. at the moment in Italy. So that's I, no I small agree. translation. No, but, it's, uh, but they're poems, so it's short. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and also poems, I think, they, they, they either translate themselves or you have a hell of a time. Mm -hmm. And with her, they really translated themselves. They really just wanted to go into English and it, was, it wasn't all that hard. But Fernanda did so many translations and with so many different writers over the years. And I think I deeply admire her ability to stay in the dissatisfaction that the work of translation involves. Because you, uh, the more you know the two languages and the more you know you're not quite getting it, that you're, you're really going to get very close and you try to get even closer, but you know you're never going to get there. So you, you live in that. And she lived in that for her entire life, which I find uh, extraordinary. Yeah. So there is one thing that you say about the letters that she sent to you while you were in boarding school in Florence and uh, you say, um, I don't know how to describe uh, what her letters did for me, but they were like uh, a life vest. Well, uh, imagine having I had lived in Japan, and then suddenly my parents decided I should get an Italian education because I was Italian. But they stayed in Japan, and I was sent off to Florence. And the boarding school had a very thick front door, uh, which only opened once a month. And then only uh, if somebody they knew and had put on a list uh, could come and pick me up. 
And usually we, there was just one couple, and it was a kind of recalcitrant couple who would uh, come take me out to lunch at their house. Then they would fight over who would take me back uh, to the boarding school. So when I was in boarding school, there was a, you know, it was very strict. And we, 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 this is just to give you the background against which Nanda's 60s pop wonders started <laughs> to fall on my head. Um, if you took a bath, there was a, a lady posted at the door watching you. Um, and you had to take a bath wearing your underwear. So that was the background. With very beautiful frescoes, I shouldn't, you know, omit this wonderful detail. So these uh, texts by Eldridge Cleaver and um, Allen Ginsberg arrived in this context, and they made me very happy because I, I suddenly, without opening any of the doors, which were unopenable, I could be outside of this place. I could be somewhere else entirely. And the entire three years that I was there, uh, I, I lived in this boarding school, but my head was in the fresh planet. So were you, you were sort of an orphan with your parents in Japan. Well, uh, I, had, Nanda, I had Nanda, who was <laughs> such a nurturer, yeah. and in a way so maternal, although she didn't have children of her own. No, she always used to say that you couldn't bring children into this terrible world because she was such a pacifist and of course the Vietnam War was going on and she just believed it very deeply until uh, she and her husband split up and then at that point I think she, mm -hmm. she might have regretted it. And she, she was very feminine and very interested in feminine clothes and hair yeah. and all of that and then she went through this horrible divorce in which her husband found another woman and that was the period at which I met her. And she would tell me very frankly all of her problems, which I felt honored by. She was an older woman, very distinguished, telling me the story of her pain. And I felt that she, having read my books, felt that I would understand. That's amazing. I mean. I go around the world and people are always telling me about their sex lives because they've read my book. So they <laughs> figure that I can be their shrink or marriage counselor. Planes, trains, everywhere people tell me about their sex lives. But the first one to do that was Nanda Pivana. <laughs> she did. <laughs> she did. All right. Yeah. But I nice. felt that was an act of intimacy and kindness. I wasn't bored by it because I love people and nothing that people do fails to interest me. And she was very clever. It was very uh, difficult for uh, the people who'd known both of them, the Nanda and Ettore together when they broke up because they were a sort of perfect couple, really. They were the, with the kind of couple that you referred to uh, as, you know, it was always Nanda and Ettore, Nanda and Ettore, Nanda and Ettore. That was, you know, you, it, it was very, very strange when they broke up. You know, I'm you had sure. to get adjusted to this. And also because I was not a Milanese nor a Roman, and I came from New York, so she could talk to me. That's, uh, that's probably true. Do you remember, was she still, uh, another thing that impressed me in the feminist line uh, was that she and Ettore never ate at home. <laughs> <laughs> never. <laughs> I mean, the most, the, 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 the closest thing to food you would get was jelly beans. Uh, they discovered jelly beans and because they were <laughs> the right color for the 60s. And they, she had a long tray in compartments and it was divided by colors, and you would be offered these jelly beans. But otherwise, they would eat at a, ho a hotel. Every single evening, they would eat at the con Continental, which in Italian is pronounced Continental. 
And uh, that's where they ate, which was down, down the, the road from where they lived. And so I think that the life they had was somehow too progressive for Ettore, because he then regressed um, in a certain way, because the, the person he then lived with, who was also very intelligent uh, and a wonderful woman, but she could also cook. <laughs> so they would stay at home and eat, you see. And I think, I think that sort of... Um, you know, men like to be mothered. Yeah. Um, I've been married four times. I've never known a man who didn't want to be mother. And often intellectual women don't want to do that. So you've got to find a man who feels mothered in other ways. Well, in the Fresh Planet, <laughs> in the Pianeta Fresco, in the magazine, there was one piece that Ettore Sotsas wrote about uh, Nanda. And, he, and it was describing her undomesticity. And the way he described it was, Nanda has no idea what happens in a refrigerator. <laughs> she puts the strawberry sherbet in along with the broccoli, and then the pink sherbet leaks all over the broccoli, and then it leaks onto the eggs, and then the entire refrigerator is pink. And of course it became this very funny text, but it gave you a very vivid Anti idea of how swiffery. And no woman in my family knows how to cook. My mother could, my, my grandmother could cook. They took my pride in not cooking. What? Took w pride in not being defiant able to cook. Defiant about not cooking. My mother and my daughter, neither cooks. My daughter, because she lives in New York, she calls a restaurant every day, if, unless she has help. There's a real defiance about being housewives in my family. Sometimes I wish I could cook. <laughs> anyway, whatever. But it was a kind of feminist thing in her that her husband had to take her out to dinner every night. Why not? You say one thing about Nanda, Erika, that she had the disgrace, her ill Fate, misfortune. the misfortune, thank you, uh, of being both beautiful and intelligent. Yes. Why? Why do you think that? That it was a misfortune. It, did I say misfortune? Yeah. <laughs> My God, that shocks me. But to be beautiful and intelligent is very hard for a woman. It's unexpected, maybe. And in Italy, it's a disaster. I mean, in America, we've gotten used to the idea. Anyway, nobody's beauty lasts forever, as we know. So sooner or later, you, you know, no matter how much Botox, you are not going to look at 60 the way you looked at 20. So there you go. Sooner, when I knew Nanda, she was getting old, but she was still very feminine in her thinking, in her loving of literature, and um, you knew she had been a very pretty woman when she was young. She used to say, Hemingway chased me around and around and around, and I would not sleep with him because I was loyal to Ettore. And what did he do? He ran off with another woman. So, you know, she knew the problems. And she was very funny about it. And because I write about these things often in a humorous way, she could identify. I mean, I thought she was absolutely the greatest fun. And so did you. She gave me entirely the wrong idea about Milan, I must say, um, in those visits. Uh, when I was very young, I thought Milan was just the most extraordinary place. And the reason I thought it was because of her and, <laughs> and, and, and Ettore. But I mean, and, and without them, it's a very different city, I must say. A much more serious place. Much more, yeah. she, was, uh, she had a kind of intuition and about people that was very deep. Now, I knew Allen Ginsberg not very well 
a little bit. We both went to Columbia and hung around there at a certain point, although he was much, much older. But he had a, a special kind of intuition. When I was very young, I was like a whirling dervish. I couldn't sit still. I was overwhelmed with energy. And whenever I saw Alan, he never said anything about my poetry, although I used to say to him, I love your poetry, I love your poetry. He never said a word, maybe he had not read it, but he said, Erica, learn to sit. By which, of course, he meant meditate. And later in my life, when I thought about him, I thought, how did he know this? I was frantic, frenetic. I needed to learn to meditate, and somehow he knew it. And Nanda had that sixth sense as well. So what luck. I always think that uh, um, much, much later in the 90s, I, I worked with a Tibetan Lama on a book. And, um, and he was the teacher of Allen Ginsberg. So, uh -huh. so I, I always think that the, that the first, the beginning of that was really with Nanda sending me that Tibetan Book of the Dead, which Allen Ginsberg had given her. And then Another connection <laughs> between yes. us that we didn't yeah. know we had, mm. which is lovely, I think. Because people come into your life at certain times, when you need them, whether as critics, translators, whatever, and then looking back, you see how all these people played a part in helping you become who you needed to be. Everything is connected. Yeah. And uh, Alan and Fernanda were very, very close friends. Mm. They worked together for 15 years, uh, as you explain very well in the documentary about Nanda when you say she wasn't just uh, his translator. They also worked together line by line. And uh, in fact, uh, speaking about Pianeta Fresco, the literary magazine, an artistic magazine that she founded together with Ettore and that ran for uh, a couple of years at the end of the 60s, um, there were three people working at that magazine. One was Ettore, the other one was Nanda, who was the uh, responsible director, which is a way of the saying way, it. The way they call it in Italian. Yeah, the, the way they call it in Italy, which is, all, which is like exec, executive editor, something managing like that, editors. the managing editor. And uh, so in Italian, it's direttore responsabile, which means the, respons the director responsible. And Ellen Ginsberg was the third person working at that magazine, and he was the irresponsible <laughs> director. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they were really close friends. And... Um, some of his things were the first things that Nanda had you translate. And at the same time, you say uh, that if it weren't for Nanda, probably all of those beat poets, like nobody would, would have known have about been known them in Italy, in Italy at all. At all. That's true. Yeah. So what, mm. can you, what can you tell us about these, about the beat generation poets, about Kerouac? What do you know? What did she tell you? I knew about them, I read them yeah. when I was learning to write. No, the anecdotes that did ever, did she ever Never. tell you I anything? can't tell you, she told me anecdotes about Hemingway chasing her around the bed, but not about Alan. Not about that, no. <laughs> well. <laughs> well, I think there was a, uh, an important thing that happened in the 50s, maybe even earlier, I think in the 50s, when uh, Ettore Sotos got very ill, he, he had a kidney failure, and he ended up at the Salk Institute in California. And, um, and Nanda knew Allen Ginsberg at that point. But, you know, one writer brought another, and their room was just constantly flooded with visitors. And I think in those years, Nanda's knowledge of the poets and poetry uh, began. But I think, and I think also to give Nanda her due where it usually isn't given, 
uh, I think it was in those years that the idea that Ettore Sotsas later had for something called Memphis, which was a series of very subversive uh, furniture designs done with a group of young designers from mm -hmm. all over the world, I think it began there also. Memphis. I think he was very influenced by, mm -hmm. yeah, by, by people like Ginsburg and Kerouac and, and the Amer American literature in general. So. You know, artists need other artists, but they're so jealous that sometimes the friend, they're so jealous of other success that sometimes the need that they have gets crushed, can't be fulfilled, but we need each other. And we have to be able to give up that competitiveness <coughs> in order to um, inspire each other, really. And that's important, but because the rewards in writing are so unequally divided, some writers make money, some starve, and they're very competitive people. It's, it's quite sad, really. We need each other so much, and we have to learn to nurture each other, I think. Well, I, I think that it's on, uh, on YouTube, there is a very funny encounter uh, that Nanda talks about between her and Gregory Corso. And, um, because some of these creatures were quite hard to put up with. And Gregory ha Corso <laughs> had a habit of putting his hand in your dress. <laughs> <laughs> and it, he, I met him a couple of times, and you didn't like it. I mean, he, he just believed, because he was a hippie and a poet, that he could grab you. And uh, it was annoying. <laughs> really to annoying. Say the least. <laughs> and in those days, we didn't have a Me Too movement. No. So you'd sort of put up with it, because he was a famous poet. But was it exciting? Absolutely not. And I remember people from the Me Too generation say, what did you do? Well, we didn't know what to do my generation, so we ran around the seminar table, or we took their hand out of the dress. They were so arrogant, these poets. Was he straight? He may have been gay, he may have been straight, but he believed he could dominate women. I have no idea. I mean, it never went further than sticking his hand in your blouse, but there was a kind of arrogance about men, whether gay or straight, which, too bad. So Nanda <laughs> could make herself into a kind of tape recorder sometimes. I mean, she could just, I, I, I encourage you to look at these uh, scenes on YouTube. She could just sit through it. Yeah, there's a, famo a famous interview uh, of her with Jack Kerouac, uh, and Jack Kerouac is drunk throughout the entire interview and it's really embarrassing because we have this amazing writer uh, that she trans not translated but that she uh, she had published because she was the person who convinced the publisher Mondadori to actually uh, buy this book and publish it and so um, there's this interview where he just doesn't know what's going on at all but somehow she manages to Kerouac. And somehow well, she, she manages I'm glad to I interview never knew him. him. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, male writers in that generation felt they had to prove how sexy they were. It was a thing, right? <laughs> well, um, but how did you how did you encounter? <coughs> I never met her. No, but you I came across her. Uh, I came across her work as every Italian, as every Italian reader, um, because I I read what she did. I read 
her, um, her translations. And uh, in fact, uh, I graduated from high school with this dissertation on the Spoon River Anthology that had been translated by her and was her first translation. And so I, I have to say that for real, she, um, when Pavese contributed in changing her life by making her discover her destiny, at the same time changed everyone, everyone's lives in Italy, readers' lives, because we had access to a whole new world that before that moment wasn't really there for us because it was right after World War II and when Fernanda and Cesare started translating together. And uh, uh, so Italy was in need of this much more emancipated literature that was mm -hmm. so different from everything else that uh, we knew back then. Well, of course, I wasn't alive back then, but I can imagine because mm -hmm. uh, the literature coming from fascism and from the previous years was so pompous and different. And although there was so much that was important at the same time, um, there is, a, there is a thing that Cesare Pavese used to say uh, about um, American literature, that it was something more than just a culture. It was a promise of life. It was mm -hmm. the destiny calling. And it was mm -hmm. that same literature that old school Italian critics used to call barbaric yeah. because it was so different. But Fernanda Pivano used to say it wasn't barbaric, it was young and it had this big advantage of being of coming from another place so it wasn't burdened by tradition it was just young and that's it francesca you, you know i don't know very much about the prize can you of course yeah yeah sure uh, especially because in in a few minutes you'll have to read who the winners are, you ha okay. you'll have to let us know. Um, so this Fernanda Pivano Prize, uh, and Erika was one of the recipients in Her, 2009. The first, the first when, yeah, the first um, so this prize started out in 2003 as an uncompetitive prize that was assigned every year um, to uh, an Italian personality of culture uh, that had distinguished himself or herself, uh, and starting from 2009, when Erika was the first international recipient, it started being uh, assigned to American writers that, again, had distinguished themselves through their work uh, translated in Italy. And uh, amongst the recipients, there were Erika, Joyce Carol Oates, Rick Moody, um, this year is a little bit more special because the prize, which for a long time had been assigned in Milan, um, goes back to Liguria, which was Fernanda's region, because in fact mm -hmm. Fernanda was born in Genoa. And so um, there will be a festival this weekend in Santa Margherita Ligure, which is a beautiful village on the Ligurian coast. and. Um, the Premio Fernanda Pivano, the Fernanda Pivano Prize, will be uh, assigned uh, in these three days of concerts and readings and panels and performances. And uh, so we, we have two lists that are two um, short lists. One for uh, the actual, I don't know how to say this in English, but like the, the big category, uh, the Fernanda Pivano Prize, and then the Fernanda Pivano Prize Pianeta Fresco, the Fresh Planet, named after the literary magazine that she had founded together with her husband, uh, which is assigned to writers uh, younger than, like 45 years or younger. Um, so if you... Are the writers here? No, no, they will be... Uh, They're not at this um, Not here tonight. They will no. be okay. in, uh, in Italy this weekend for the, the prize ceremony. Mm -hmm. the, yes. Um, so what we could do now... Um, so we have a list. Who, who chose them? 
Um, so there's a... Um, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's always interesting. <laughs> um, there's a committee, mm -hmm. uh, and in this committee, uh, there's uh, Enrico Rotelli, who was the long-time uh, biographer and editor and uh, assistant of Nanda. There is Dori Getzi, who was uh, the wife of the late... Castilla. Yeah. of the late uh, F Fabrizio de André. Um, and so, yes, um, what the price tell, told me that we should do now is that I should give you uh, this list. Mm -hmm. So you should mm -hmm. read the list of the Pianeta of Fresco. Lists. Yes, so here's the, the finalist list of the Premio Fernanda Pivano, Pianeta Fresco. Elaine Castillo, Lauren Groff, Lisa Halliday, Kevin Powers, and John Jeremiah Sullivan. And Erica mm -hmm. will read who we won this the, prize. We get the envelope. Okay. I thought the writers were going to be here. No, they, they, they're oh, traveling they're to Italy. They're going to be in Italy. Yeah. Okay. They're luckier. <laughs> okay. So the first winner is Kevin Powers. Anybody know his work? Okay. Um, there is a little biography here. Born and raised in Richmond, Virginia. Um, MFA in poetry from the Michener Center for Writers. And um, he served in the US Army in Mosul and Tal Afar, Iraq. Studied English at Virginia Commonwealth University. I'm very disappointed he's not here. <laughs> I was misinformed. <laughs> okay. And I haven't read him, so I can't comment. And the other winner, who is on his way to Italy. We have to. Have so, <laughs> oh, here's, here's the list. Thank you. Yeah, the prize is not assigned tonight, unfortunately. It will be assigned. So this is the big prize. Premio Fernanda Pivano, finalists. Nathan Englander, Jeffrey Eugenides, John Irving, Rachel Kushner, and Yi Yoon Lee. Okay. I, I only learned to pronounce Eugenides today because I thought it should be pronounced in the, in like a Greek surname, which it is, but it's not. Okay. The Premio Fresco. Nathan Englander is the author of the story collections for the relief of unbearable urges. What do we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank? The novel, the Ministry of Special Cases, and Dinner at the Center of the Earth. His books have been translated into 22 languages. And he's the other big winner. That's the big winner, and Kevin Powers is the winner of the Pianeta Fresco Award. OK. So, um, I'm sorry to say he's won a Sue Kaufman Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. His play, The 27th Man, premiered at the Public Theater. He is a distinguished writer in residence at New York University and lives in Brooklyn. They all do. <laughs> we all do. New York, with, he, with his wife and daughter, his newest novel is Kaddish.com. I'm really sorry I don't know these writers, but I will read them since I've given these prizes without them being here. <laughs> <laughs> Which is odd, but okay. No, we're just announcing them okay. and uh, there will be a full ceremony. And what is the at prize? The festival. Mm? What is the prize? Uh, is uh, she knows because she got it's one. It's a oh, yes, glorious yes. piece of sculpture that you're rather embarrassed to put in your living room <laughs> because it has your name in big gold letters. And I really believe that a writer is always a beginner. An artist is always a beginner. And I don't put awards on the coffee table because then when I'm trying to invent a voice for the next book, it won't come. I'm very superstitious, you know. We're always beginning again. 
when we write. Whether I write a book of poems or a novel, I'm now writing an autobiography, but you're always beginning again, and you can't have a line of awards on your desk because it's a jinx. But that's just my personal opinion. Are they, are they in a cupboard? What? Are they in a cupboard? Do you keep them um, in the closet? I put them here and there, mostly in the house in Connecticut. Who, this sounds very Ananda-like, this prize with the gold. What? They it were was close friends again, I think. Uh, Arnaldo Pomodoro, this uh, is the Italian Pomodoro. artist. Pomodoro oh, made um, the sculptures. Yeah. And they're not enormous, but they're very glittery and gold. And it would make me nervous to have that on my writing desk. But, you know, there's summer in the country and summer in the city. And I, I'm very suspicious of writers who win too many awards, if I may say so. Because politics usually is the thing. I never win awards except in Italy. And uh, yes, in Deauville, in France, and in other places, but in my own country, absolutely never. Never, which I guess I'm beginning to think it's a mark of honor. <laughs> well, there's this famous um, uh, Latin saying that says that nobody's a prophet at home. In his own land, right. Oh, maybe. Or her own land, yeah. right. So there you go. But. I wish them all well, and I wish there were money involved, because writers always need money. That's a universal. So before we go, I would like to let you ask questions, if you have any, so. Thank you very much, very vivid portrait. I wonder whether the other of you knew her when Pavese died, and what, uh, how, she's a, yes. how she was affected by is that whether you knew her at that time? I just wonder. It's very nurturing to me. But she I think at any that. age we would have liked each other <coughs> because mm, so we both talk had. About that. Never talk about the reaction to the death of. No, I he, never did. You know, it's a Although death. I knew him, I knew his work. Yeah. I I think that at the time uh, there was some talk of. Uh, I'm not sure that this is historically correct. And I haven't researched it, but I, but apparently, she had just turned him down. So, uh, um, Nanda Pivano had just turned down Cesare Pavese, who was very in love with her, and he'd made one other attempt to uh, marry. He wanted to marry her, and and uh, there is a possibility that um, it may have been one of the. Yeah, if I may say one of the reasons, one of the if I may say one thing, uh, one thing that was um, famous about Pavese, besides his wonderful ability as a writer, was the fact that he was always in love with someone. Yeah, so he was he had a fragile soul, he had a tender heart, and uh, there's also a song by this great songwriter called Francesco de Gregori, um, in which there is a Cesare, uh, and this Cesare, well, uh, story goes, is Cesare Pavese, and uh, uh, it speaks about this, about the fact that he was, he had many, many um, loves in his life, un un unrequited loves, Quite yes. And uh, so because Fernanda, Nanda, for Nanda sure, was, was, for, was, was with Ettore at the yeah, time. Yeah, and was even before that, Ettore, so it was a little bit when she difficult. was young, when she was in college, they were when he was uh, her substitute teacher. He was not. He was not that older. It was maybe a few years, and then they would never have dated back then. But when she was already studying at studying at university at uni, um, then it was different, and they could have dated. But she just was in love with someone else, the man she ended up marrying mm -hmm. and who ended up breaking but her heart. I had the feeling that everyone fell in love with Nanda when she was young. <laughs> and that she enjoyed it, being having people in love with her, whether she reciprocated or not. She seemed to be that kind of woman. I mean, 
And I trusted it completely because she was funny about it. You know, it, she wasn't vain about it. Yes? Um, I would like to say I, I love the idea of actually being able to read your work eventually when I have time. But um, I wanted to ask something. Um, I've seen films of Ginsburg, you know, and he had, he was talking about something that I didn't understand. It could have been him or somebody else, I don't know, because it's so easy to get plastic surgery or whatever, but he was saying something about, um, uh, uh, you know, drinking in women, and he had a problem, and I was wondering whether that was, like, on religious lines or if you knew anything about that. Uh, and, um, uh, Kerouac, to me is, uh, you know, I just wanted to clarify that drinking and, you know, a certain kind of alteration that you get from the use of substances. That was fundamental to that kind of well, you know, in the States, actually, because it's a non-denominational country, you know, it's really all about a personal relationship with God. It's a First Amendment situation. So any kind of like drinking and any kind of, uh, you know, taking mind altering substances, even tobacco use, is seen as a holistic mystical experience that is theistic. So I was wondering how that would fit. And whenever I saw Pivano on TV, she would always express herself like an intellectual. Like I remember seeing her, we were expatriates in Italy, my father, mother, and I, in the 60s and 70s, and she would express herself as an intellectual, you know, um, uh, exclusively. And she, she translated, or she had, she, she, she had something to do, I think, with On the Road, but I'm not exactly sure. Can you clarify that? Who? Oh, right. Kerouac. Yeah, she she didn't translate it, but she helped uh, get it published because she was the person who wrote the first report on it. And even though the editors at the Mondadori Publishing House were uncertain, they didn't want to to publish to publish it, so they said no. At a party, uh, a few weeks a, a few weeks later, she was able to sneak into the publisher's office because it was a party held at Mondadori's home in Milan. And so she was able to talk to the boss of bosses and say, uh, there is this book that will make you sell thousands and thousands of copies for years and years. And so you should buy it. And he took his little notepad and he, he wrote on the road, Kerouac. And so. Well, to be, able to, to be able to see another culture that way is very rare. And to bring the books of that culture into a very different culture, that is amazing to me. And, to understand and very few people can do that. To understand the potential yeah. of something. And also, publishing was a very small it was a very small world in Italy at that mm -hmm. time still. So you could go into a party and see, the, you know, and she obviously knew everybody that might publish a book. And mm -hmm. Yeah. It's still a pretty small world Italian publishing. I mean, although huge companies have taken over, but the people who are editors and translators all know each other. That, you know. Anyway, I think, yes. Thank you guys so much. Um, all three of you have been very lovely to listen to. Erica, I'm curious to know more about why you think you're popular in Italy, and you seem to sort of have an, affi an affinity with the Italians, and why you think that is. I have absolutely no idea. I think, no, I think it started with the fact that women in Italy needed freedom, and my books spoke to them about freedom. And because I was an American, not an Italian, instead of being a scandal, I was a hope. Um, and because I come from a different culture, but the culture I come from has some of the same ideals as Italian culture. 
adventure, discovery, um, breaking free, um, creating a new, a new way of, of telling stories, a new way of traveling. These are things that Italians and Americans have in common. But if an Italian writer had written about sex in the outspoken way I did, probably, you know, she would have been sent to a convent <laughs> at that period. But because I was an American, I was allowed a certain latitude. And then people began to identify with my books, including men. Um, but I think that's why it began, really. And I presented a hope of liber liberation. And I'm very grateful for that. Because what I always wanted to do was write the books about women that didn't yet exist. So that was my goal. And to be able to do that in different cultures. Now my books are translated into Mandarin and Arabic. I have no idea if the, if the Arabic are, books are censored, because I can't read Arabic. But if I'm inspiring people to be more liberated, then certainly I want to be in Arabic and Chinese. So I feel very gra grateful and blessed to have had that kind of effect in different cultures. But Italy is so much like my own culture. When I first started going to Italy, and coming from a big extended Jewish family, where my grandparents and my parents and my three sisters and I all lived together, I felt very much at home in Italy. The family structure seemed familiar to me. Um, my grandparents were very important in my life. My parents were childish when I was a kid, and they were bohemians, and they didn't want to give, have much time for p parenting. So my grandparents filled that role. And I always felt very at home in Italy, and in the familial structure, and in the way the generations relate. Can I ask the last question? <laughs> um, I think this is a question for Jeannie. Um, do you think that um, Fernanda was also working in, in the reverse direction, meaning making Italian writers known in America, or not? Or to you? <laughs> I think I, the only Italian writer I heard her talk about really was Pavese. Mm. Um, no, I think she was completely, she was an American. It's a one-way street. Yeah, I think <laughs> from that moment when she opened the Spoon River anthology, she was, mm. she, she went over to the other side. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> she, she identified with the spirit. Yeah, completely. Very much, yeah. And the, of the time as well, yeah. Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much, our thank guest you. Erica, Ginny, and uh, Francesca.